Hi, I'm J.M. DeBoard, and I am an author and dream interpreter. I am known online as Radal. I am one of the lead moderators at the reddit.com dreams forum known as Our Dreams. The Redditors out there will know exactly what I'm talking about, but for the rest of you who are not familiar with Reddit, it is one of the largest online social media platforms in the world. And the Dreams Forum is the largest public forum for dreams that I know of. We have around 40,000 subscribers. This has given me a lot of experience with two topics that come up a lot in the Dreams Forum, which are nightmares and recurring dreams. So that's going to be the subject of this lecture. I... I'm going to talk about nightmares first, the sources of them, what can be done and can't be done about them, and then I'm going to get into recurring dreams. We're going to interpret a couple of dreams along the way, and I'm going to teach you what I know so that I can help you understand your nightmares and your recurring dreams. So settle in. This lecture is going to take a little while, but it's going to be real enjoyable and you're going to learn a lot. So let's get into the lecture now. Why do you have nightmares? I gave a list here of possible sources. The first one, chronic stress, is probably the leading cause of nightmares. I emphasize the chronic part of it because stress is a part of most people's lives, at least occasional stress. But when stress becomes chronic, that's when it really starts to affect you badly. And your dreams are there to help you to understand um, what is affecting your health and well-being. So if chronic stress is part of your life, your dreams are going to want you to address it. And nightmares are a great way of getting your attention. Health problems. Number two on my list is another source of um, nightmares. Pretty common. Health problems can really stir up a lot of fears in you. And fears are often what's behind nightmares. So the two go ha hand in hand. Trauma and wounding, I find this cause behind chronic nightmares or recurring nightmares. Something happened in the past, it really traumatized you, it really hurt you, and you will dream about it in very powerful and vivid ways. A nightmare, by the way, is a dream on steroids. It's a nightmare, we have a separate classification for it, but really it is a dream, it's just a bad dream. And when dreams are bad, it's usually because there's something behind them that's really trying to get your attention. Emotional bottlenecks is the next uh, cause on my list for why we have nightmares. Dreams help you to process your emotions, and if you have a bottleneck in your emotions, your dreams are going to address it. Realize that dreams exaggerate things, and if you have some powerful emotions that you leave to your dreams to process for you, then they are likely to be exaggerated, and that's when a dream turns into a nightmare. Last on our list is sudden and shocking events in your life. And this doesn't really need a lot of explanation. Something happens in your life, it is sudden, it's shocking, and that night you have dreams that you, you know, bad dreams, you have nightmares. Okay, so let's move on here. I have some more possibilities for the reasons why you have nightmares. One is bad digestion. Believe it or not, you if you are experiencing bad digestion while you are sleeping and dreaming, then it is likely to be turned into dreams. And if it's bad enough, then those dreams become nightmares. I'll get a little more into that later. Uh, certain drugs, particularly the class of drugs known as SSRI, are known for producing nightmares, I'm not going to say much about this. I'm not a physician, but I would recommend if you want to go further with this to look up Cymbalta nightmares and wait till you see some of the dreams that people describe, the nightmares they describe after withdrawing from that drug Cymbalta. Sleep paralysis is another source of nightmares. There's a lot of confusion about sleep paralysis. In the medical literature, it is known as REM atonia. Atonia means muscle slackness. And 
Sleep paralysis or rematonia is a normal state of affairs usually because it prevents your body from acting out your dreams. The mind, the nervous system is muted. The pathway between the brain and the body is muted so that you don't act out your dreams. Well, sometimes what happens is you wake up, you are in that state of paralysis and you uh, don't know what's going on and you're still dreaming. The dream imagery overlays with what you're seeing with your open eyes and the dream imagery is reacting or reactive from what you're feeling. So you wake up, you're paralyzed, uh, you experience fear or worse, terror, and then the dreaming mind, which translates all input into symbolic imagery, takes what you are feeling and turns it into symbolic imagery. Thus, we have dreams about uh, abductions by aliens, uh, uh, witches, demons, burning in hell. I mean, I've, I've seen the gamut. And so sleep paralysis can be a reason why you have nightmares. By the way, the best thing to do in that situation is to breathe. A couple of deep breaths will usually break the spell of sleep paralysis. One last reason why you have nightmares. Conflict between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Dr. Carl Jung, the famous Swiss uh, psychiatrist, uh, famous for his insights into dreams, said that conflict between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, in his opinion, is the number one source of nightmares. Because the unconscious mind is, for one, much vaster, deeper than the conscious mind. The comparison the used by neurologists is, here is your conscious mind, here is the unconscious mind. 95 to 99% of your mind is unconscious, and in the unconscious is the blueprint for the ideal you. Thing is, though, is that the conscious mind doesn't always agree. Conscious mind is basically the ego, and it doesn't always agree with what the unconscious mind thinks. And when that relationship becomes antagonistic, well, it's kind of like picking on the 800 pound gorilla. I don't think you want to poke it too many times. It's not that the unconscious mind is ever really hostile towards you, but it has an agenda. It wants to help you to become the ideal version of yourself, at least as far as it sees things. And if you are antagonistic towards it and don't listen to it, then it's going to keep cranking up the volume until you get the message. And well, how do dreams crank up the volume? They give you nightmares. So the best thing to do with conflict between the conscious and unconscious mind is try to understand the unconscious mind better. I have some other lectures on that subject and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But in the meantime, what can you do about nightmares? Well, first I want to say that from my experience as a public expert about dreams, someone who gets asked a lot this question, what can you do about nightmares? I want to say that the my answer is going to boil down to you have to address the underlying cause. You can't just, you know, forget about it. You can't wish that your nightmares will go away. You have to do something about it. There's a reason why you are having the nightmares. I'm going to get a little more into this in just a minute. Let's go ahead and look at some of the first suggestions. Consciously process emotions and events. Don't leave it to your dreams to do it for you. I mentioned earlier that your dreams exaggerate. They amplify and they process emotions. If you have emotions that need to be dealt with, and you don't do it and you go to bed then you are asking for bad dreams and if the emotions are powerful enough and the situation behind it is powerful enough then it will it will lead to nightmares it's almost a certainty what can you do well de-stress talk to yourself write in your journal take a break Journaling is a 
it's known in uh, therapy circles as being one of the best ways of addressing nightmares. And uh, I highly recommend it. You start off by writing about the nightmare, write down all the details that you can remember, and then just let it pour out. Whatever it is that's on your mind, that's on your heart, just start talking to yourself through the writing. A lot of times you will talk yourself through to the understanding, the insight that you need, and to at least vent some of the things that are caught up inside of you, if not come to some kind of solution. Address chronic situations. Again, chronic is underlined because you know, I talked earlier about stress, that we all deal with stress, and that a chronic stress is really, a, you know, probably the number one source of nightmares. So if a situation is chronic, it is causing stress, it is something that needs resolution, the longer it goes on unresolved, the more likely you are to have nightmares related to it. So address whatever the situation is. Think of your dreams as messages, and nightmares are the volume on 11. It is cranked up. You need to get the message. Oftentimes, though, the message comes to you in story form told through symbolism. You can refer to my language on, or sorry, my lecture on decoding dream language to understand how dreams speak through symbolism and string the symbolism together into stories. You need to get the message. Do something about it. Heal your sore spots. Sometimes that is uh, simpler to say than it is to do, but if something inside of you is wounded or traumatized and it needs healing, it is looking to you to do something about it. It needs you to decide that you will do whatever it takes to help that part of you that is traumatized or wounded. Oftentimes it is stuck in the past at the point when you were traumatized or wounded and it will continue to re-experience the trauma and the wounding until you do what you need to do to heal it and bring it into the present. It will not come into the present until you tell it that it's safe. Improve your mental or physical uh, health. This is one of the main things you can do about nightmares. And I want to make a deeper point with this is that everything that you do to help yourself is noted by your unconscious mind, your attitude towards yourself and your health and your well-being is noted by that part of your mind and if you are doing things to help yourself the unconscious mind will meet you halfway or further in other words as you help yourself you get a helping hand from the other side and remember this is your conscious mind <laughs> this is your unconscious mind the unconscious mind can tap into all of the knowledge of our species going all the way back to its origins and perhaps before. So having your unconscious mind as an ally is a really good idea. Make peace with your unconscious mind. And the best way you can do that is to do everything to live the life, the best life that you possibly can and be the best person that you possibly can. It doesn't mean that you need to be a saint. In fact, uh, Dr. Carl Jung, was known as quite the rascal. He was um, a powerfully insightful man who understood his unconscious mind very well. And he often spoke very stark truths when it needed to be said. And he was not exactly a saintly person, but he did a lot of good for a lot of people. So understand that your unconscious mind is not asking you to be a little angel it understands you have a little devil in you too but what do you do with that side of yourself are you aware of it or do you try to avoid it if you try to avoid it to pretend like it doesn't exist then it works 
from behind the scenes to influence you. This is the side of you that is known as shadow. And man, shadow is a, you need to understand your shadow. You can put into a search engine, uh, Carl Jung and shadow, and you will find some good resources on this. You can also go to my website, dreams123.net and use the search box, type in the word shadow, and it will take you to my lecture on this subject. It is a, uh, a subject that's too deep to go into here. Just know that sometimes shadow can be behind your dreams. And the reason why shadow has the power that it does is because there are things about yourself that you don't want to know that are outside of your conscious awareness and control. And uh, the shadow then can control your life from behind the scenes. What you can't do about nightmares. Well, first of all, you cannot ignore nightmares and hope they go away. Kind of like in the picture there, the little old lady looking out the window and look what's behind her. It's your nightmares will not go away by ignoring them. Um, you can't drink or drug them away. You can temporarily. I mean, you can get really drunk and go to bed or get really high and go to bed and you can numb yourself out, but it's not making them go away. It's just temporary relief. And when they come back, they're going to come back stronger. So, you know, you can't drink or drug them away. You can't expect to do the same thing, uh, or you can't do the same thing expecting different results. This is a popular definition of insanity. It is a quote that is attributed to uh, Albert Einstein. He was kind of known as a smart fella. And uh, oftentimes the source behind nightmares is, is that you're in some kind of a pattern that needs to be broken. So, you know, keep doing things the same way and, well, you're going to get the same result. There's a basic message behind nightmares. It's that something needs to change and that message is being amplified. It is being screamed at you if the nightmares are recurring, if they're chronic. So get the message, something needs to change. And sometimes it's just as simple as waking up the next morning and looking at the number one thing in your life that needs to change and doing it. Sometimes it's as simple as adopting a new good habit. I, I wanted to use yoga as an example. This is very personal to me. I, I need to do more yoga. And I've been told by my dreams many times that I need to do more yoga. And yet I wake up in the morning and you know, I might stretch a little bit or something. But boy, you know, I'm kind of like the mule that needs to continually be kicked in the butt in order for to get me to move. I mentioned this because, hey, I'm not perfect either. I understand that change can be difficult. And here's the thing, if the change is really needed, your dreams will keep sending you shocking messages. They'll keep prodding you until you make that change. And if you don't, then it's probably leading to a decline in your health and well-being. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into situations that are known to produce nightmares. Uh, number one on our list, job stress. I see this a lot as a moderator at the Dreams Forum and as a public expert on dreams. Um, people ask me about their nightmares. I help them to dig into their lives to find the source of it. And oftentimes it comes back to job stress, relationship troubles, or intractable situations. We talked about chronic situations that need to change. These are the top three culprits right here. Let's look at a few others though. There are some others. One, uh, sudden shocks such as death and misfortune that is likely to produce a nightmare, especially if you go to bed and you have not processed the shock. You know, uh, you get fired from your job. Your uh, significant other says that they're leaving. A uh, close friend, loved one, relative uh, dies or is suddenly in a uh, health crisis, something like this. Um, this is going to produce nightmares if, again, if you do not process the event and the emotions behind it. Avoiding your conscience, knowingly doing something that you shouldn't. This is a, this is a source of nightmares. Uh, what else can I say about it except you know that you are avoiding your conscience. And the unconscious mind, again, that has an agenda, 
It wants to help you to understand yourself better, to become um, the best person that you can be. And if you are knowingly going the other direction, your unconscious mind is going to respond to that. It's going to use every tool in its box, realizing that uh, nightmares are uh, kind of a last resort. Situations known to produce nightmares, inability to change or correct yourself uh, or correct a situation. We've already kind of covered a lot of this. Bad diet. I wanted to get a little bit more into this. I was on a podcast a while back. It's called To Eat Perchance to Dream. And uh, the hosts uh, said, hey, I, I want to get into uh, foods that can affect uh, dreaming. And I thought it was a fascinating subject. So I did some uh, research and I found a few suggestions for him. And he and a friend ate those foods and then chronicled, you know, before bed and then chronicled what happened, how it affected their dreams. I don't know if I recommend it or not, but uh, blue Stilton cheese is a very uh, pungent form of blue cheese. And that's one of the cheeses that they, you got to listen to the podcast. It was pretty fascinating. There is a, um, a long tradition in dreaming uh, circles, people who uh, try to understand dreams, maybe not necessarily from a medical perspective, but you know, dreaming has traditions surrounding it in all cultures and all times. And um, diet has been talked about a lot in various sources that I've read. Carlos de Castaneda in The Art of Dreaming addresses this. Um, Edgar Casey, the famous American psychic who was also a uh, masterful dream interpreter, he addresses it. And basically, bad diet is going to lead to bad dreams and that eating heavily processed foods and pungent dairy products before bed is known to produce bad dreams. In um, Native American traditions, they say that you need to give yourself time to digest any meat that you've eaten because their belief, at least in some of the tribes, is that the uh, spirit or essence energy of the animal is still in its flesh. And if you are processing that f uh, flesh, then uh, processing that energy, whatever you want to call it, while you are dreaming that it is likely to take form in some way in your dreams and it's likely to be some kind of a nightmarish dream which might explain the uh, killer cows that came after me the other night and the chickens that were trying to pluck out my eyes anyway so just be aware that diet can have a big effect on your dreams and that your best bet is to not eat really anything up to two or three hours before bed. If you do eat anything, make it plant-based, nuts, uh, vegetables, fruits, something like that. Interpreting a nightmare. This is the same basic process that you will go through to ter interpret any dream. You first look at the opening scene to identify the subject. Um, I'm gonna get into a dream that I'm gonna explain all of this here. I have an example coming. You want to ask yourself, particularly with nightmares, what do you see about yourself in the dream characters? Nightmares often involve some kind of interaction with a character or characters that have it in for you or have it out for you. Uh, they're after you. It's whether it's a monster or animal or person or a shadow being or alien or something like that. It is basically a dream character. And most dream characters are based off of you. They are you personified in some kind of way. The more that they feel ignored or repressed or wounded, the more it's going to show in the very powerful imagery in the dream. So you see the uh, bloody person in chains who's coming at you with a knife, and it is a part of you that feels like your conscious attitude towards it is harming it and repressing it. This gets really deep into psychology. I, I don't want to go too far into it, but I, it's very important for you to understand this. Um, let me give you another example. 
there was a uh, a woman who came to Reddit Dreams. She'd had a dream about going into uh, a basement of her childhood home and there was a child down there that was like floating off the ground and had this maniacal look on its face and she just felt like waves of pure evil coming off of this child and if i remember the dream correctly it had a knife in its hand and uh, it was going to come after her and you know, it's easy to misinterpret something like that. I've had people even think that a dream like that is a harbinger. It's a warning that someone's after them. And I'm like, you know, you really have to look at the dream characters being part of you. What is, What are you hostile toward about yourself? And what, a, to, what about you is hostile towards you? Or what about you is wounded or traumatized or angry? And in this case, the answer was actually fairly simple is is that inside of this adult woman was a child that had experienced some really terrible things and she had just kind of left it all behind you know this is a coping mechanism for us to be able to function in our daily lives and it's there comes a point when that part of you it needs you to help it so when you, the more you ignore it, the more it's going to try to get your attention. This is a very uh, good insight for you to absorb. It's just trying to get your attention. And how does it get your attention? It sends shocking imagery at you and gives you a nightmare that you can't forget. Interpreting a nightmare. The details of a dream, they all connect together to form into a big story. And behind the story, behind those details, are your emotions and feelings. So when you are interpreting a dream, you want to connect the dots between the details. The dream is telling you this big story it has these small details that interconnect with each other and then they it all comes out into this big picture and in that big picture in one look you can see everything about the dream and all of the situational and the personal dynamics that are at play oftentimes what's really behind it that connects it all together is an emotion or a cluster of emotions. And if you can just look at what you were feeling in the dream, realizing that it's probably amplified, and then connect it with how you feel in your waking life or how you have felt, then oftentimes that can lead you to the meaning of the dream. It's the breadcrumb trail that you follow and, it, and you end up at the meaning of the dream. If you are in good health and haven't experienced a recent shock lately, then most likely a chronic situation is the uh, cause of the nightmare. And this can really help you to interpret it because you're looking for the source. That is ultimately why we are interpreting the dream. We're looking for the source of it and then applying what we learn to our lives. So we know that bad health can be a source of nightmares. We know that recent shocks can be a source of nightmares. And if you can rule those possibilities out, then really focus in on situations in your life that are chronic. This is going to sound a little bit counterintuitive, but look for the good in your nightmares. Remember that they're trying to help you. Um, that is the reason why you dream. Your dreaming mind wants to help you. No matter how bad the dream is and how nightmarish it is, the intent of the dreaming mind is to help you in some kind of way. There is an opportunity here for growth, for change. We know that sometimes change is what is needed in order to help with your nightmares, to help to alleviate them. So look at the nightmare as 
it's getting a message to you that you need to get and it's doing you a favor by making sure that it gets your attention, that you notice it, that you remember it out of all the dreaming that you do in a night. You can spend 25% of the time that you are dreaming in the REM stage of sleep when dreams are the most vivid and meaningful. So if you're only going to get a few minutes of content out of your nightly series of dreams, then the nightmare is going to stand out to you. And there's a reason for it because it's the most important message that you need to get out of everything that you dream about. And so there is some good that can come from it, but this is where you come into play consciously when you decide that you are going to pay attention and you're going to do something about it. I want to get into an example dream now. This was a nightmare that was brought to me at uh, Reddit Dreams, and it's very powerful. It's going to pull together everything that we've learned so far. This is a dream from a young woman. She dreams that she is at home folding laundry, and she looks out over she's on the second floor in her bedroom and she looks out over the banister and she sees this skinless creature and its flesh is exposed she can see muscle and tendon and blood vessels and all that it's holding this really big knife and it locks eyes with her and it, it comes at her so battle is on epic fight ensues they end up in a bathroom and she throws that just, you know how dreams work, like there's a box of Epsom, Epsom salts there. So she grabs the box and throws salt from it onto the exposed flesh of the creature and it screams in pain. She pushes it, it falls into the bathtub and she runs away and then realizes that she forgot to grab its knife. She goes outside in front of the house into the street and the battle continues. A city bus runs over the creature and then bystanders detain her as if she's at fault. And then the creature gets up and the dream ends with the idea that this is going to be continued. Wow. What a fascinating dream. And it can, everything in this dream can be understood. We need to apply some of the things that we've learned already. And then we're going to connect the dots and we're going to see how this all connects with the dreamer's life. So let's go back to uh, the opening scene. She's at home and she's folding laundry. We know that the subject of a dream is often announced in that opening scene. And in this case, the symbolism of folding laundry, uh, well, first it has various possibilities for meaning, but I know from uh, experience with this that it often connects with straightening up your life, specifically your outer life and the way that you present yourself and also including the way that people see you. Clothing is on the outside of your body and it's what people see about you. A very different impression can be cast between dressing up in a nice sports jacket or wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm with stupid, you know? So the way that you present yourself, clothing is closely as associated with that. So she is folding laundry. Laundry has been freshly laundered. So there's also the action of folding it, which implies organization, straightening up. I'll get back to that in just a second. Let's look at the skinless creature. We also know that you see something about yourself in the dream characters, and this creature is a character. And if you just look at the way that it presents itself to her, it is in a raw and wounded sort of state. So we want to start asking, is the dreamer raw and wounded? Is there something about herself that she's seeing in the creature? Actions are also very important for dreams. It's where symbolism often defines itself. It's through dreams are sometimes called metaphor in motion because they have this powerful metaphorical symbolism and the symbolism is in motion. That's how it defines itself. It's how it tells the story. So what we see is 
a fight. Fight is a conflict. How does that relate back to the dreamer in her life? She also, another important action is she throws salt on the creature. And hearkening back to metaphor and motion, you might ask yourself, am I seeing a metaphor being enacted here? Are we seeing salt on an open wound? I'll get to that in a second. So she runs outside and the battle continues in the street. You might say that she was just trying to get away, but I think there's a deeper reason for this because when you are out in the street, it is something that is going on in public as opposed to where the dream opens, which is in private. So we have this idea that comes into play that whatever the conflict is behind the dream, that it is something that is out in public. The city bus that runs over the creature is another detail that supports this idea because the dream could have picked a greyhound or a school bus, but instead it picks a city bus. Okay, city is public, it's public transportation. So we have another detail that reinforces the same idea. This is a public conflict. The bystanders detain the dreamer as if she's guilty, and then the creature gets up and the battle is to be continued. Let me tell you what this dream is about, and we'll get back to some of these other details and we'll tie them all together. The woman who had the dream is involved with a lawsuit with a former employer. She got hurt at work and she sued them. The lawsuit has been ongoing. You know how lawsuits can be. They can take a long time to wind through the courts. Well, what she's found out in the meantime is, is that she has been applying for jobs and she recently found out that the former manager at the place, the employer that she's suing, that person has been spreading rumors about her saying that she's a bad person and a bad employee it's affecting her ability to be able to get work. So now we see part of the reason why this thing is becoming public, but I'll get to that. Skinless creature comes at her with a knife. Okay, well, we understand that detail a little better now because she is the one who feels raw and wounded, plus the action of the creature is like this thing is after her. It wants her skin. It's... it's uh, so what we see in that detail is, is that she is um, feels like this conflict is just continuing to come after her. It's really bad, shown with the big knife. It's very personal, and a knife is a very personal weapon. Um, so these dynamics of the situation are coming into play and showing in the dream details. Salt on the wound? Yeah, you know, it's bad enough that she got hurt at work and wasn't able to work, but now she's trying to go back to work and she finds out that she's being sabotaged by her former manager. So that's salt in the wound. The battle is in the street. We know why now that it is a public battle. A lawsuit is a public situation. City bus runs over the creature, which is another way of saying that it is a, uh, it's a public battle, but also she thought that the lawsuit was going to be the end of the situation, but it turns out that it's only the beginning of her conflict. So we see in the end when the creature gets up and the battles to be continued that it's connected with the detail of this lawsuit going on and on with her and the troubles that it causes her life just keep mounting, um, adding up. The bystanders detain her as if she is guilty. She feels like she is paying over and over again for what's going on with the employer. The ways that her work, her life presently is being sabotaged by what happened in the past. It is detaining her life. It is preventing her from moving forward. It is preventing her from being able to get her life straightened up. It connects with the original opening scene here where she is trying to straighten up her image by folding the laundry. That's a symbolic action. And then she finds out that her image is being tarnished by this rumor campaign that is uh, being um, pushed by her former manager. 
So now we see how all of these details come together to tell a story about what's been going on in her life, and we see that it was sparked by her recently finding out about what her manager has been doing behind the scenes. I think it's a fascinating dream. It shows what's going on in her life. What can she do about it? Well, one is she can understand the dream. It's going to help her to vent and release some of these emotions. And two is the dream might help to inform her decisions from here forward. She needs to have this situation resolved. And I don't know, you know, what that means as far as the lawsuit goes, but she could perhaps tell her lawyers about this and they could get on the manager's case. There could be other things that she could do, but now she's aware of this huge impediment in her life. She knows that she wants to get her life straightened up. So what does she do from here? Well, the dream takes everything, turns it into a story, and then she can do something based off of what she learns from the story.